summer off and my health issues were bad. But one of the things that's happened, uh, which is a, a roundabout way to get to your question, but I think it's really relevant. One of the things that's happened at the University of California because of the anti-affirmative action programs is that we have, for the, in, in the admitting freshman class, less than 100 African Americans admitted to UCLA. That's immoral. That's just immoral. And probably most of those are student athletes. And so I think it's really time, and there's a lot of support from Latino legislators and the larger educated Latino community to really look at this. And so I've told my colleagues, I would like to do this program, because this program crosses, it doesn't have to be about migrant kids. This kind of program, we can't wait for the university or the legal system to do something. What we've done with the migrant program, we've grown our own. We've increased the numbers of kids participating in these programs. So one of the first things I want to do is I've told my colleagues, I want to help do this kind of program for African American students on our campus. As a, just as a response to that immediate question. Now to the larger question of, of unrest, one of the things that, there's so many ways we need to do this. There's not one single solution. In my after school club, there's predominantly, you know, one of the issues comes around displacement. There are large numbers of Latinos moving in, right? And so that creates, understandably, um, friction with people who have had so little for so long and, and they feel displaced and there's so many issues. So one of the things we do in our after school club, because the school is 90% Latino, 5% African American and 5% Pacific Islander, I work with the principal to over admit African American and Pacific Islander students from the school into that after school club. So the after school club becomes really a diverse place, right? And so that the children have many opportunities because it's all around joint activity to work together. Um, and it creates a wonderful learning environment in which kids start to see the possibilities. And so I think we have to think about it on so many levels in the way we design our programs, the ways we are consciously dealing with these things across the pipeline. Um, certainly in the community, we do it. Um, um, our work is about, is really about building coalitions. I, um, Professor Carol Lee from Northwestern and I, spend a lot of our time, we do a traveling road show, we say, to really foster this. At ARA, as chair of social justice committee this year, I'm actually, one of the invited sessions is on continuing the conversation with the, uh, on the black-brown dialogue. And so I've gotten senior educators and new assistant professors and graduate students to participate in it, because we need to start doing it. We can't wait. This is an important issue. Um, and, it, and it's one of those that I feel deeply committed to, both personally and, and professionally. Does that? Yes. Guess, guess, okay. Thank you. Yes. So go to that session. It's going to be really good. Oh, you're not going to do it? Okay. Well, ask for their papers. Yes. She wasn't funded. Does somebody help her fund it? <laughs> You're absolutely right, but it's amazing the transformation that takes place. They don't see themselves as victims, or that, and they start to, with, the, with teatro, I can't tell you how beautiful it is. If I could take a second, because it's instrumental to, the, um, to their transformation, as well as the parents. We have a parent institute that does the same things, and you know, most of these parent programs are very paternalistic and insulting, so I tell them, we need a pro I tease and say, we need a program to help these parents become obnoxious middle class mothers like we are, right? Because that's what works. Man, I work in that school all the time for my son, right? That's, that's what makes a difference. But th with this teatro, what happens is it becomes a public problem solving activity. So for example, they'll take an issue, like for example, someone was called a name, right? And so you make a scene of that in the teatro, and then you enact that scene, and then you talk about, you go out and say, well, was that problem solved? And then some, you know, let's just say somebody got called a name, and so what happened is the response was, right? Which is not, not what the kids would do, but just say for an example. So then we talk about, 
Well, what just happened? Did you feel good? Well, yeah, okay, but did, did the, was the problem solved? And what might also happen? Well, you might get hauled off, you might get sued, etc. cetera. So, uh, so then we get to enact it again. And so if somebody gets, has the opportunity, uh, one important thing, the group is carrying out the scene, and then there's the protagonist who enacts it. You can only take the role of the protagonist and never the antagonist. And that's fundamental because you can't deal with the antagonist. You have to have the agency as a protagonist to do things. So let's just say for the next scene, you can yell stop and you can come in and do it in a new way. And then we talk about collectively, well, what happened? How was that mediated? Was the problem solved? What would we have to do? And it's amazing how the enactment of these things provides, extends the toolkit even further for the students. So it's not just reading and writing about all day they draw on the readings when they're doing it, but it's really having a chance to talk about these real scenarios in context that makes a difference. And as one student, I was just giving a talk a couple of weeks ago, and I, I mentioned, I was talking about the program, and there was a young lady in the audience who was now getting her master's. And she says, I want to stand up and tell you that this is really true. <laughs> I went through it. And she said, the biggest difference is that they really, um, they really be, learned to be, a, they, they were legitimate participants at the university. And she said, and that just made all the difference for me when I came. Now, do we follow them formally? Other than we track them where they go to the university, but we can't follow them because we don't have the resource to do it. But informally, they continue to email every single person on the staff. They ask us for, we, we help them with their letters of application, with their everything. So that network never goes away. We still get, I just got a, a, an email not too long ago from a kid that was in the program eight or nine years ago. So informally, it's a, it's a powerful network. And I use all my graduate students to teach it so that this is transformative both for graduate students as well. And so they have a long, long network wide network to use. But other than that, uh, they, they learn to do it on their own, I think, with this network. Somebody else? Yes. and that's why we do the autobiography. They learn the traditional, we do all the genres extended, you know, they're writing, 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 and reading. But one of the things when I showed you about where's hope there, that's critical because these autobiographies, oh my God, they break your heart. They are, they are unbelievable when you think about the things that kids have had to negotiate. But if we left them there, right, then what we've done is they're recounting they're just recounting their lives in a ways that could make them feel hopeless. And what's so fundamental is that that's why I say reframing the past is critical. They have to think about their past as a resource that they bring into the future. And one of the first things that happens in that transformation, is these are adolescents, remember, these are, you know, not just teenagers. And one of the first things that happens is that they redefine their relationship with their parents because they start to see their parents the, as migrant workers in the conditions that they live. And so when the parents come, the first thing they say to me is, what did you do with our kids? They're just completely different. So it's really understanding who they are in relation to that history and their family that, that makes them think very, very differently about themselves. So it's not about discounting. We, they rewrite, they, they do narrate the pain and the suffering, but fundamentally with the way we were teaching and talking in the teatro, it's about how does that give you strength? How does that become a resource for you to do other things? 
Um, and I think that's a fundamentally different way to see yourself as opposed to thinking about, given that they are the most vulnerable population in the state, and probably in the country, right? So that's one, that's one of many, but one very important thing is, and I don't think that that's usually the take that happens with students, is that how to use that repertoire that you have as a real tool uh, for, for making history. And we have followed them and formed, they do become, they become leaders. They become leaders in their schools, in student governments, and so they do see themselves quite, quite differently. Uh, but it's a, it's a long process. Now, why can we do it in a month? I think that pressure cooker of a month, I think that the staff is so committed. Um, but I would also argue that it's not enough to just have committed staff. These, the, 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 the staff is, they're theoretically grounded. They know about not only the history of of colonialism and of these kids' lives, but they understand deeply learning and development and literacy learning. Because otherwise, I think we could just be a feel-good program. And what I think allows these kids, aside from becoming historical actors, is that they have a real toolkit. I mean, they learn a social critical literacy that the byproduct is academic literacy, right? So they can go to the institutions and negotiate those texts in that work. And because they're working from 6 a.m. to midnight, when they get to college, they have a real taste of what it's like because we, we are working around the clock. So I think that that literacy toolkit that they have about how to make meaning. I remember a young, a young man at Nesta who I, I'm always standing in the hallway when they come out like the principal, I think. And when I said, how did they go? He goes, man, um, uh, one of my students, Arash, uh, Arash broke reading down. Man. I really got reading. He broke it down for me, right? And so I think that they start to get reading and writing um, to see them as tools, of sense-making tools. And, and I think that that's a powerful toolkit that they take away from, from the Institute. And that's why they can get admitted to the UC. Yes? That's a very good question. We don't select the students. You know, the, 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 re the federal government gives money to the state and they're divided into regions. But there is a, a significant Asian migrant population and they're mostly Hmong, um, Vietnamese, and, and uh, we do have some Punjab students, right? And some Vietnamese. We have gotten in the program um, maybe as many as 10 a year who are Asian students. And um, one of the things that we have really tried to encourage the larger state program is to give us more students. Because this is, and what, one of the things that's it's interesting to us, we've struggled with it because we have so much available in, in Spanish for the students. So how do we negotiate it? And one of the things that we found, well, we try to use the students themselves to help us translate. And we try to get the resources so they have it available. And we translate everything. So if it's not in, said in, in Spanish, it's, everything's available in English. The contradiction is that we're then privileging English all over again, so it's, we haven't quite figured that out. But one of the interesting things for us is that we don't just privilege, we don't just talk about migrants as Mexicans, right? It's about what is the migrant and immigrant experience. And we have found that the Asian students who've been part of it, who could feel displaced because they might be 10 out of 100 that are in that program, right? But our experience has been that the 10 really get integrated into the program um, deeply because the issues, the experiences are so similar that it resonates to them, even though they are, that there are going to be some differences as they're immigrating from different countries. But we have found, we, um, it's been very successful with the Asian students who've been part of the program. But it's not a, comp I wouldn't be completely satisfied because we still don't have all the language resources available like we do in Spanish. But nevertheless, I think, I think the reason that it's worked is that I think that it's so clear to the students how committed people are to helping them think about education differently and about their potential. 
that they still feel very, they participate uh, and become very integrated into the community, uh, which I think is a, is, a, is a wonderful kind of testament to how it is. So. But there's a lot of work still to be done, and many, many more Asian students should be part of these programs. Chris, I want to thank you so much for uh, just a fabulous talk. Thank you. Thank you. And my guess is if, if you had a question that didn't get answered, she might stay here for a Sure, absolutely. Thank you for the audience. Thank you very much.